Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Seberg. I'm the Assistant Director for the Medical Cannabis Research Center at Drexel University. We are uh, pleased today to have Dr. Ben Cochiaro uh, to present on uh, the clinical perspective for medical cannabis. Uh, Dr. Cochiaro is an Assistant Clinical Professor in the Department of Family Medicine, Community Health, and the College of Medicine at Drexel University. He's also a co-investigator on the Medical Cannabis Research Center's registry study and other upcoming clinical studies. Um, he's also the former director of medical education and the board treasurer at Prevention Point Philadelphia, which is an overdose prevention organization, and um, I believe it's in Kensington. Um, he's also served on Philadelphia Mayor's Task Force to combat the uh, overdose epidemic. Um, he's also given talks at uh, Penn State Hershey on a similar topic uh, for the medical applications of cannabis. And we're pleased to have him today to, to give this presentation. I'll hand it over to you, Ben, and uh, take it from here. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Jim, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, listening to me drone on. Um, hopefully, I'm going to make it your, worth your while today. We're going to talk about the history of medical cannabis. We're going to talk a little bit about the neurobiology of how the different cannabinoids work. We'll analyze the methods of uh, medical cannabis acquisition and intake, both from a, a legal and from a pharmacologic perspective. We're going to evaluate the evidence regarding the risks and benefits of cannabis and its various applications. Uh, we're going to learn to screen and diagnose and treat cannabis use disorder. And uh, we're going to provide evidence-based counseling for our patients on um, uh, specifically how to uh, address pain, anxiety, PTSD uh, with cannabis. So the cannabis plant's earliest presence in the human archaeological record dates back about 10,000 years uh, to Central Asia. Uh, 4.7 thousand years ago, we see it enter into the uh, Shen'an Ben Jing, which is the world's oldest pharmacopoeia. 3,000 years, we see it spread to the Ayurvedic practitioners, uh, and it reaches Europe by the, Schis the, the Scythians about 2,500 years ago. Uh, a thousand years back, um, it's included in the writings of Arabian physician Avicenna, uh, who describes its use as an anti-emetic, anti-epileptic, and analgesic may sound familiar to you. Uh, it's first brought to the Americas 400 years ago by Africans who were enslaved by the Portuguese uh, and is used in those communities for ritual, medicinal, and recreational purposes. 200 years ago, Western medicine catches wind of cannabis. Irish physician W.B. O'Shaughnessy, who worked in Calcutta, publishes the first English treaties on cannabis in 1839, and in 1860, we have the first U.S. medical conference on the therapeutic properties of cannabis. This occurs in White Sulphur Springs, Ohio. At the bottom right, you can see a clipping from the proceedings in which Dr. McMeans from Sandusky, Ohio, shares a prescription of cannabis and milk sugar for the treatment of gonorrhea. Uh, considering that the gold standard at the time was a caustic transurethral injection of mercury, salts, and silver nitrate, this treatment was likely better tolerated, if not more effective. Uh, most of the big pharmaceutical companies started making cannabis extracts by the mid-1800s, and uh, they enjoyed widespread use for several decades. But with the advent of the hypodermic syringe and the advances in synthetic chemistry, the industry moves away from the production of extracts in favor of synthesis of injectable morphine, chloral hydrate, and barbiturates. This trend towards synthesized pharmaceuticals joins at the turn of the century with a more nefarious and overtly racist tendency within the US government to use regulation, regulation of psychoactive substances as a tool of oppression and control against specific racial and ethnic groups. Harry J. Anslinger, the first commissioner of the US Treasury Department's Federal Bureau of Narcotics, targeted black people, immigrants, and musicians, planting newspaper articles with such titles as, Reefer makes darkies think they're as good as white men. Anslinger would go on to handcuff singer Billie Holiday to her deathbed, and his tactics would continue for more than a century in a coordinated product, project of state-sponsored violence, which we refer to today as the war on drugs. By the 1930s, cannabis is all but removed from the national pharmacopoeia over objectives, objections uh, of the American Medical Association, and it's not until about 1989 that the FDA approves dronabinol, uh, and in uh, 1996, the California state uh, legalization of medical cannabis, the U.S. medical community returns to using cannabinoids. Um, following the isolation of Delta-9 THC, or tetrahydrocannabidiol, uh, as the primary psychoactive compound uh, in 1964, there's subsequent blossoming of molecular research on cannabis. 
while a single inflorescence or bud of cannabis may contain over 120 different cannabinoids, THC is thought to be responsible for the lion's share of the psychogenic effects of cannabis, interacting with CB1 receptors in the body's endocannabinoid system, which are primarily located in the central nervous system, and CB2 receptors, which are found primarily outside the CNS in peripheral tissues and importantly, also in immune cells. Both CB1 and 2 receptors belong to the superfamily of G protein coupled receptors, which I take personal interest in because they're one of the most evolutionarily conserved uh, pieces of genetic code. Uh, we share more or less the same plan for G protein coupled receptors that slime molds have. Uh, so it's a, a, just a fascinating piece of evolutionary history there. Um, Cannabidiol or CBD is the other principal component of cannabis and exhibits weaker binding to the CB1 and 2 receptors, but strongly inhibits fatty acid amide hydrolase, which is an enzyme implicated in both pain and anxiety pathways. Uh, it's less psychoactive, but has important modulating functions on the uh, THC experience, which we will discuss later. Terpenes, of which there are over 100, are another class of cannabis-derived compounds. They've been subject to less study up to this point, but are increasingly thought to contribute not only to the aroma and flavor of cannabis products, but also to the specific perceptual effects of the drug. Now, colloquially, most people divide cannabis into two strains of indica and sativa. While this distinction is justified by a significant association in the literature between indica strains and sedative perceptual effects, the picture is complicated by the fact that the vast majority of strains on the market are actually hybrids. We can see on the right-hand side a uh, diagram from a paper by De La Fuente three years ago that indexed and uh, ran through a GCMS machine uh, 800 different strains of, uh, uh, of cannabis that were listed on the Leafly website. And you can see that there's a significant amount of crossover and hybridization between indica, uh, sativa, and hybrid. So um, other classification systems, such as the one proposed by the Israeli Medicinal Cannabis Agency, propose a phenotypic or cultivar classification according to relative levels of THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids. Um, while studies from the last decade cast doubt on the accuracy of product labeling, medical cannabis grown in Pennsylvania is required by law to be grown indoors and each batch must be tested in a reference lab. Uh, labels must contain detailed information regarding the cannabinoid and terpene profiles of each product, as we can see in this example label on the right-hand side of the screen. It's a little hard to read, but you can see up at the top the, uh, the weight of the product, uh, and then you can see the percentage of THC, THCA, CBD, and then at the bottom, a terpene analysis. So, um, Given the wide heterogeneity of cultivars, I always make a point when I talk to patients uh, about keeping a journal to help them identify which products and doses work better than others and to consult with the dispensary pharmacist for specific recommendations. Uh, there are a number of different modes of administration that we can broadly separate into inhalation, oral administration, and topical administration. So with inhalation, which is this uh, first and second column here, um, maximum plasma concentrations are reached within five to 10 minutes, and they're maintained at a steady state for about three to five hours. There's a rapid distribution of the drug to the central nervous system, and there's, generally speaking, higher systemic bioavailability of uh, inhaled products compared to orally ingested products. Uh, smoking notably is technically disallowed in Pennsylvania due to the production of combustion byproducts and the concomitant effects of cough, bronchitis, and large airway inflammation that you see when you burn any kind of plant material and put it into the lungs. Um, that said, it remains informally popular due to patient preference. Uh, vaporization, on the other hand, heats dried flour or concentrated extracts to temperatures below the rate of combustion, but still hot enough to volatilize the active compounds and introduce them into the uh, systemic circulation. While it's not been proven that vaporization is objectively safer than combustion, I do counsel patients who smoke daily that switching to vaporization or another route may, may improve their lung health. Oral administration, of course, avoids the lungs entirely. 
Onset is uh, usually going to occur within about 30 minutes, so this can be much prolonged depending on what's in your stomach at the time. Uh, Tmax will occur within three hours, and the overall effect usually lasts about six hours, but may, again, depending on uh, metabolism or digestion, last up to 24 hours. Um, ingestion, in which the product is swallowed, is subject to high first-pass metabolism by the liver and also uh, is subject to uh, a variable absorption across the alimentary tract. Um, on the other hand, transmucosal uh, absorption, where the uh, tincture, for instance, is placed under the tongue and allowed to sit there while the, uh, the venous circulation under the tongue uh, um, absorbs the medication, bypasses this first pass metabolism step and, and has been suggested that, that it might produce a more consistent um, pharmacologic effect. And, and indeed, we see a lot of research in the area of cannabinoids focus on uh, uh, sublingual sprays, for instance, Sativex, which is marketed by GW Pharmaceuticals in about 13 countries right now. Um, finally, we have topical administration, which is uh, the least studied among the various routes, but may increase local bioavailability by bypassing this first pass liver metabolism that I mentioned earlier. However, skin penetration is often an issue given the lipophilic nature of most of the cannabinoids. So uh, there's a, a hot field of research right now in terms of, of what adjuvants you might add to a uh, topical preparation to make it more readily uh, uh, pass the, uh, the skin barrier. So the specific laws in Pennsylvania um, uh, came into effect in 2016. Um, and uh, by 2018, medical cannabis became available in the Commonwealth. Um, all Pennsylvania cannabis is grown indoors, which uh, potentially results in products of more consistent purity than those that are grown outdoors and uh, more readily uh, ready to hybridize with, uh, with uh, strains in the air. Uh, flour is available in dispensaries, but again, explicitly, this is not for combustion. Um, edibles are completely unavailable. However, they do have tinctures, pills, and RSO or Rick Simpson oil, which can be uh, uh, processed into edibles uh, in the home. Uh, every dispensary employs a full-time pharmacist, which is an important thing to note um, because uh, they are among the most knowledgeable when it comes to guiding patients uh, who have certain symptoms towards certain products. A yearly certification exam is required, as is a registration fee of $50 uh, that is usually discountable to individuals uh, who are uh, on SSI or have veteran status. Um, the certification exam itself uh, ranges in price, depending on where you go, from $75 to $250. And in order to certify patients, physicians must take about an eight-hour course um, I took mine through uh, Jefferson. Uh, they have an online uh, course that's available. I think it costs 250 to enroll. Uh, and uh, I, I felt like it was quite informative. Uh, employers notably cannot discriminate or retaliate against medical cannabis patients based on their urine drug screening, though this has yet to really be uh, uh, proven out in the courts. So um, Please note that physicians are permitted to certify to the state that patients have a qualifying condition and may therefore visit the dispensary. While we can stipulate on a certification form specific recommendations for the types of cannabis products that our patients would use, it's important to note that these are not prescriptions. To prescribe cannabis, which remains a Schedule One drug, um, it would be in violation of the Controlled Substances Act, and if I wrote it on a prescription pad, would uh, land me in handcuffs. So the certification exam uh, follows uh, with, with several components. Um, these guidelines are from Health Canada and describe the, the broad parts of the visit. So prior to the visit, I have patients fill out a detailed medical history form that describes the condition under which they're attempting to certify their uh, daily experience and chief troublesome symptoms and any treatment they've had up to this point. Um, I ask for an additional medical history focusing on other conditions and medications that they're taking in addition to supplements. I ask for a psychiatric history that includes prior hospitalizations as well as any um, psychotic disorders, suicide attempts or self-harm. 
Uh, I take a substance use history, including alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and other substances, as well as their frequency of use. And I ask about pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, the FDA strongly advises against the use of cannabis in pregnancy, and uh, even dronabinol uh, is listed as category C um, in, uh, in, in the uh, pharmaceutical literature. So during the visit itself, we review uh, all of this information together. We establish the diagnosis. And then we really dig into their treatment history to make sure they've received the standard of care. So, uh, you know, for patients with pain concerns, I ask if they've been to physical therapy. What medications have they tried? What are the specific functional limitations? For patients with mental health problems, I ask if they've seen a therapist or tried any psych meds in the past. Um, I don't ask these questions necessarily to disallow patients who have not tried everything under the sun, but rather I, I ask the questions so that um, patients know that, that there may be other options beyond cannabis, other options that indeed might have more evidence behind them. So from there, we talk about symptoms that concern them most, and we review the evidence for the use of cannabis and the management of their conditions. Uh, I make sure to discuss not only the benefits, but the risks of cannabis, including its adverse effects, uh, the different features of cannabis use disorder, which we'll cover later. Um, and uh, Pennsylvania law stipulates that I do a prescription drug monitoring program lookup on the patient. So I use uh, this information form to query uh, and help corroborate what the patient's telling me with regard to the other medications that they might be taking. Um, later, we discuss dosing strategies and uh, try to establish specific functional goals for the treatment. Um, this all kind of comes down to what are we trying to do with the cannabis? And finally, I take them through the registration process. Uh, once the certification is submitted, patients will get an email from the state and must order their cards. The card takes about five to seven days to arrive. Once they're in the hands of the patient, um, they can visit any dispensary in the Commonwealth. So what are the indications to certify patients? Um, this table uses the AAFP Strength of Recommendation Taxonomy, Taxonomy or SORT criteria to stratify Pennsylvania's list of qualifying conditions by the extent to which they're backed up by quality patient-centered data. Uh, here in category A, we see indications for which the recommendation is based on consistent and good quality patient-oriented evidence. For most of these, it means that they're backed up by at least two good quality randomized controlled trials diagnostic cohort studies, or systematic reviews or meta-analyses of the same. Uh, these include chronic neuropathic pain, cancer and uh, chemo-associated nausea and vomiting, HIV AIDS, uh, specifically wasting syndrome and neuropathy, multiple sclerosis, and uh, opiate use disorder. In category B, we see indications backed up by only one good quality study, or multiple lower quality studies, or good quality but conflicting studies, and these include uh, ALS, uh, anxiety disorders, autism, uh, dyskinetic and spastic movement disorders, epilepsy, uh, with, the extent, with the exception of Lennox-Gastau syndrome, which is, uh, uh, has been extensively documented, the, the utility of CBD and the treatment of that, uh, glaucoma, PTSD, inflammatory bowel disease, sickle cell anemia, Tourette syndrome, chronic nociceptive pain as to be differentiated from neuropathic pain, and uh, terminal illness. Finally, in category C, we have recommendations that are just based on consensus, usual practice, opinion, or case series data. This includes Parkinson's disease. And um, since I, I initially composed this slide, Pennsylvania has added hepatitis C to the list. Uh, I see a hand up from, from Dr. Szymanski. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, so uh, there are a couple of things here that raise some interesting questions about the um, uh, physical and behavioral survey that you described at the beginning, okay? <clears throat> you could probably tell me what I'm about to ask you. Um, uh, let's start first with the opioid use disorder. So in your survey, you're essentially trying to determine, as it says on the thing, What's the risk for substance use disorder? Now, clearly, if someone comes to you with opioid use disorder, which is um, a legitimate request under Act 16, then you've already determined that they have a risk for substance use disorder and the idea is substitution, right? 
Correct, correct. And there, there are several studies that suggest that when employed in the context of opiate use disorder, um, opiate use does fall off fairly precipitously, sometimes by as much as uh, as 50 percent. Right. But then the question is, what's the purpose of um, of um, screening for risk for substance use dis disorder? Presumably, it's for you to make a, an informed decision about whether or not to certify the per patient, right? Indeed. And, and I would just point out, you know, in, in my when I think about substance use disorders, I think about opiate use disorder, of course, because it, it's these days one of the most, you know, uh, uh, fatal, um, though perhaps not in absolute terms that would involve alcohol. I think a lot about the sort of patterns of substance use disorders. So there are, you know, people with opiate use disorders who have pain conditions, and that's what drives their opiate use. There are those that come to opiate use disorder through trauma or emotional distress. Um, and then there are patterns of, of substance use that involve polysubstance use, stimulants and opiates together, stimulants, opiates, benzos, alcohol benzos. Um, and with each of those patterns, there's sort of a, a different place that we might consider for cannabis in, in, in the treatment there. Um, sometimes I would say cannabis might, would be a, a good addition to the, the treatment protocol. Other times I, I would think that cannabis might not be the best. Um, and, and I would follow all of that up with, with recommendations around dosing, because certainly um, taking a person who has pre-existing uh, polysubstance use disorder and giving them access to exceedingly high potency uh, cannabis products may not be in their best interests. Um, that's one of the reasons we're allowed to stipulate on the on the patient certification forms um, whether or not the patient has access to the full armamentarium within the uh, the dispensary, or whether you would recommend specific products. So, oftentimes, if I if I feel like there's a um, a serious concern that the patient's going to get worse if they uh, wind up using a lot of high concentrate cannabis, uh, I'll write that you know this patient might uh, do better, or they should avoid. Um, concentrates, and uh, they should have access instead to, you know, say CBD to TH one to one CBD THC tincture or or uh, higher CBD THC ratio products. So thanks. I was hoping uh, I expected that you would do exactly as you did and explain that you don't screen for risk simply to block people from having access, but better to understand your strategy as a um, uh, as a physician and how you might apply treatment and understanding and not prescribing, but that's still the assessment. Um, and the other question is, anxiety is, um, as we all know, a very broad term for um, uh, lay uh, people uh, and much more structured for um, psychiatrists and psychologists. And so the question is, do you use any formal instruments to um, define it better when someone says they have anxiety? So oftentimes I will ask about their specific treatment history of anxiety and other psych diagnoses, because um, certainly there are, there, we might consider there to be five separate anxiety disorders, um, you know, major depression with anxious features, uh, social anxiety disorder, specific phobias, et cetera. Um, when I think about anxiety disorders as they relate to medical cannabis, I, I I often think back to the 1800s when when cannabis was used more widely uh, by medicine, and and it makes me consider the the diagnostic paradigm that we currently use to to diagnose mental illnesses. And this is something that really only goes back uh, to the 1950s through 70s as the the DSM really uh, uh, built up its its credentials and its um, you know and its sort of adherence and and defeated the the uh, ranks of the psychoanalysts. But w when I think about anxiety, I think more in psychodynamic terms, in terms of how does the patient situate the anxiety in their lives, and what are they using the cannabis to do for the anxiety? Um, because certainly, if, if they're using cannabis as uh, a facilitator of isolation and avoidance, that's not going to go well for them in the long run. Um, however, there are patients where they, they situate their cannabis use 
in more uh, facilitating terms where they, they use the cannabis to get over uh, agoraphobia or their specific phobias, for instance. And in those situations, I, I, you know, I think, again, to the, uh, the psychoanalytic work of uh, Zinberg's drug set and setting paper, where, uh, again, he focuses on, like, what are you trying to do with the drug? What's your mindset going into it? And what's the, uh, the context in which you're using it? Uh, oftentimes, I find that to be more beneficial therapeutically than, than what precise DSM-5 diagnosis does the patient carry. Great. Thanks a lot. And in the 1800s, there was a lot more opium use and 7% solutions than cannabis. So. Oh, in, indeed. And, and some, of the, some of the most notorious users of those opiates were, were us physicians, because we were the only folks who could afford the syringes. Yeah. Thanks very much. No, no, thank you. Um, so I want to go through um, the... Um, the way that we might think about cannabis and its use of neuropathic pain. Um, mind you, when I talk about neuropathic pain, chronic neuropathic pain, we're talking about symptoms that are daily or nearly daily. These are symptoms that demonstrate um, typical neuropathic characteristics, so buzzing, tingling, shooting pains, as opposed to more like achy pains, uh, pain that affects quality of life, and that's been going on for three or more months. That's chronic neuropathic pain. There is grade A strength of recommendation evidence for the effectiveness of cannabis in reducing chronic neuropathic pain. And you'll note that the number to treat to improve one patient's pain by a third compares favorably to that of gabapentin. Um, down below the um, list of numbers needed to treat, you'll find a um, forest plot from a recent a uh, paper in Annals by McDonough uh, that looked at, an, uh, a, it was a meta-analysis of a number of studies um, of medical cannabis preparations um, uh, that, that are pharmaceutically available uh, and their ability to improve pain. The uh, overall treatment effect does favor intervention here. Um, when we talk about chronic non-neuropathic pain, however, the results are considerably more uh, mixed. Um, however, there is a demonstrated reduction in opiate consumption among patients with uh, chronic pain of all sorts. Um, over on the right-hand side here, you'll see an algorithm from uh, Health Canada with sort of their recommendations for how to go through a, uh, a patient visit uh, with somebody who has chronic pain. In patients who have not tried the standard medications, they recommend the standard medications. Uh, in patients who have tried them and have had a great response to them, then continue the standard medications. However, if, if there's been no sufficient effect, if the patient is still experiencing debilitating pain, then we talk about whether or not cannabis or cannabinoids might be a useful tool in this situation. Um, and uh, of course, we include that screening for substance use, psychiatric or mood disorders. And if we find them, we think again about the risk benefit profile uh, of that patient specific situation. And um, if the patient's cannabis naive, and if they are still uh, interested in trying cannabis, then we, we talk about the different tools that we might use, starting with an oral cannabinoid, um, sometimes either nabinolone or nabiximols in markets where it's available. Uh, if that doesn't work, then we uh, liberalize to other uh, routes of administration. And of course, we educate patients on risks, benefits, side effects, and, and of course, the, the, the recommendation to not divert. Uh, and ongoing, as you continue in, in the care of the patient, as you follow up with them, we monitor for efficacy, side effects. And, and I think this is really an important aspect here because we're still sort of in the infancy of our understanding of the effectiveness of cannabis in, in different pain disorders. I always ask my patients, what is it that you can do now that you couldn't do before you tried the cannabis? I think that's a, a useful question that helps patients organize their experience and, and helps us come to the conclusion of whether or not the cannabis is, is being helpful for them. Um, uh, just one quick other note 
Um, when I certify patients under this heading, I, I, I make sure that they've had an adequate workup for their pain complaint. Um, and uh, I, if they have access to insurance and if they can get to physical therapy, I, I generally will make recommendations for, for those treatments before we talk about cannabis. Um, though, ex especially with regard to physical therapy, I, I don't require patients trying it just due to issues of access, cost, and time. Um, moving on to opiate use disorder, uh, cannabis has been used in the treatment of OUD for at least a century and a half. Up in the uh, upper right-hand corner here, you'll see the front piece to Alexander Fleming. No, not that Alexander Fleming, uh, his lecture on medically supervised, supervised detox in which he recommends a tincture of cannabis, ether, and elderflower to alleviate nighttime agitation. While uh, agonist therapy is a lot more effective, there remains strong evidence that cannabis has utility in the treatment of opiate use disorder. Population level studies have demonstrated declining opiate prescription rates in states that have legalized cannabis, and similar studies have also demonstrated decreasing OUD hospitalizations and overdose rates among people who use medical cannabis. At the individual level, we find this to be the case with one recent, albeit industry-funded uh, cohort study of over 1,100 patients demonstrating significant reduction in both opioid and non-opioid pain medication dosage over six months of follow-up. And at the anecdotal level, in my clinic that works mostly with folks in early recovery from opiate use disorder, patients report that it helps them with cravings, withdrawal syndrome, and sleep. For anxiety, um, the evidence is more mixed and likely due in part to a biphasic response that patients exhibit to THC. Lower doses of THC tend to be anxiolytic, whereas higher doses tend to be anxiogenic. The effects are also likely modulated by CBD content and possibly also by the terpene profiles of the different cultivars. For this reason, I often recommend patients uh, that have higher, uh, I often recommend products that have higher CBD to THC ratios. Products with anywhere from two to one to 15 to one ratios are available at most dispensaries, and these allow patients to more finely titrate their doses to good effect. Um, for PTSD, the evidence suggests that daytime cannabis may worsen symptoms, while nighttime use may help to suppress nightmares uh, without improving other aspects of sleep quality. And interestingly, this is something that we see borne out in the insomnia literature as well, where the cannabis seems to subjectively improve sleep, but um, when they go to the sleep lab, uh, there's often no change seen in sleep architecture. So with all that said, there's good evidence uh, that daily and especially high-dose THC use can worsen both anxiety and PTSD. So my counseling to patients focuses heavily on helping them understand the landscape of all the available treatments. They certainly don't always work. The number needed to treat for psychotherapy and pharmaco pharmacotherapy for both anxiety and PTSD is in the range of three to five. Uh, respectively, and not all patients have timely access to quality behavioral health services. At the FQHC, where I see some patients, uh, I've had patients waiting for nine months to see a psychiatrist. So for these reasons, I counsel patients to pick a target for their relief. Uh, sometimes we use the GAD-7 as a way to help understand the different dimensions of anxiety. Um, I'll then counsel them that if they don't achieve their target with cannabis, that they shouldn't feel like they're doomed to feel awful for the rest of their lives, but that uh, there are available treatments with strong evidence behind them. Um, so again, when it comes to dosing, I try to focus on setting specific goals and to track progress over time. Um, because we're dealing with plant extracts, the pharmacology is complex and inter-individual responses will vary. So I tell my patients to buy a spiral ring notebook and a cheap pen and to write down what product they're using, how much of it they used, and whether, it not, whether or not it helped with their symptom of concern. For inhaled routes of administration, I'll advise patients to take between 10 and 20 minutes in between puffs of a new substance. For oral or sublingual administration, I recommend waiting between one to three hours between either uh, uh, drops of a tincture, pills, or, or bites of an edible if they, if they process their RSO into, into edibles. Because there can be a significant withdrawal syndrome, 
I will also counsel patients to taper their doses off over day to, days to weeks if they intend to cease using cannabis after a period of daily use. Finally, there are some important drug-drug interactions that we should be aware of uh, with the uh, CYP2C9, 2C19, and 3A4 classes. Um, CBD and THC will increase the bio bioavailability of uh, fluoxetine, uh, which should be of interest for patients with uh, uh, on pharmacotherapy for, for anxiety and depression. Different macrolides, fluconazole, ketoconazole, diltiazem, verapamil, ritonavir, um, grapefruit juice, isoniazid, and amitriptyline. Uh, decreased bioavailability will be seen in patients taking rifampin, carbamazepine, and St. John's wort. And uh, there can be additive effects to hypertension, tachycardia, and drowsiness with any kind of sympathomimetic or anticholinergic medication that you prescribe to the patient. So now that we've discussed some of the benefits of cannabis use and uh, the method by which I recommend it to patients, I'd like to briefly touch uh, on some specific risks that are another critical element of shared decision-making with patients. Um, so among adults who use cannabis, about 10% will meet DSM-4-5 criteria for cannabis use disorder. Um, we see the DSM-5 criteria here above. Uh, I often focus on uh, the, the top category of uh, abuse uh, characteristics, failure to fulfill responsibilities, use that physically endangers the patient, cravings, or social and interpersonal problems. Um, that allows us to avoid category down the bottom that includes tolerance and withdrawal, which may be a uh, uh, iatrogenic effect of medical cannabis use. Um, and indeed, some literature has posited that medical cannabis use may produce false positives for cannabis use disorder under those categories. So my general approach here is to ask if patients have, uh, ask if use has increased over time and ask if it's caused problems in patients' life. Uh, among those who use uh, daily and who cease abruptly, a vast majority will develop a withdrawal syndrome that begins two to six days post-cessation and can last up to two weeks. Uh, features uh, overlap oftentimes with, with uh, the symptoms of the conditions that the patients are, are trying to treat with the cannabis in the first place. So I always uh, caution patients about that and, and just let them know that they might experience increased anxiety, depression, insomnia, nausea, irritability um, when they withdraw. Uh, case reports have existed about psychosis on uh, the setting of abrupt cannabis withdrawal, though uh, it's unclear if, uh, if that is a um, uh, stochastic eddy in the literature or something uh, more important. This will be the subject of, of future research, no doubt. Um, the risk of cannabis use disorder notably was about 50% greater among individuals who use daily and uh, those who initiated use in adolescence. So I, I always, uh, when I ask about cannabis use uh, prior to their uh, medical certification, I, I try to ask when they started using cannabis. So, you know, again, non-judgmentality when it comes to history taking is, oh, I, I see John Cohn uh, with a hand up. Yeah, how's it going, Ben? Thanks. Uh, just curious, is, is, have you seen any uh, studies or statistics on CUD uh, based on form? Uh, you know, meaning maybe edible uh, over smoking or anything? Uh, I have not, with the exception of um, the relationship between cannabis use disorder and, and high potency or high concentration products. Um, so, you know, we might think that the, the poison is in the dose or, or the solution to pollution is dilution, maybe. So when I approach a patient who I think might have cannabis use disorder, I, I try to adopt a non-judgmental stance. I, I try to separate cannabis use from other uh, illicit substances. I try always to ask about the motivations behind use. Again, what are you trying to do with the cannabis. And if the patient is, is open to discussing and if they're interested in uh, cutting down or, or uh, examining more, more finely their relationship with cannabis, there are evidence-based therapies, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy um, that can improve abstinence. And um, 
I, I think that these can be very useful tools in patients who, who find themselves up against the wall when it comes to their cannabis use. Um, there has been a, a Cochrane review that looked at a number of pharmacotherapies for uh, cannabis use disorder. They looked at gabapentin, and acetylcysteine, different antidepressants, depressants, and uh, cannabinoids themselves. Um, the evidence at the time of that Cochrane review was not strong enough to support routine use of pharmacotherapy for CUD. However, a couple of papers looking at nabiximols have come out since that review was published that cast a slightly favorable, uh, slightly more favorable uh, eye towards the use of a like a one to one THC CBD tincture in the treatment of cannabis use disorder and helping patients avoid uh, that withdrawal syndrome as they as they uh, decrease their use. So uh, for patients who use cannabis but don't meet criteria for CUD, I, I always still counsel on the potential harms of cannabis use, and I provide psychoeducation behavioral support. Um, when it comes to harm reduction in this space, for the patient who wants to uh, maybe change their relationship with cannabis but is not interested in uh, full abstinence, I always try to support them in that uh, goal. However, given um, the uh, the risks of high potency cannabis use, I, I always try to um, recommend patients take maybe every three to four months a tolerance break in which they try to cease their use for one to two weeks. Uh, this allows um, the patient's tolerance to to decrease and for them to return to cannabis if they choose to, um, oftentimes needing to use a lot less of it, a lot less frequency, frequently. Um, sometimes just outlining the different withdrawal symptoms can um, uh, allow patients a moment to reflect on their use and to, to talk more freely about what they uh, feel. Um, over to the right-hand side, you see a, a graphic from the Tea Break Guide by uh, Fontana uh, and colleagues up at the University of Vermont. Uh, this was a guide that's freely available online. It was designed for, for college students, but uh, having read through it myself, I think it's a, a very useful CBT and mindfulness-based tool to help patients who, who might be interested in changing their relationship with cannabis. Um, and then, of course, patients at risk for severe mental illness uh, and especially psychotic spectrum disorder should be counseled to avoid cannabis. Uh, we see that there is a robust positive association between cannabis use and uh, the development of acute persistent psychosis. Um, there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem here. We don't know which is causing which, whether cannabis is causing the psychosis or, or the schizophrenic disorder is causing the cannabis use. Um, we do know that cannabis is neither necessary nor sufficient to cause a persistent psychotic disorder. Um, but we also know that psychotic symptoms are uh, uh, often worse in patients who take high dose THC. Um, we've also found that CBD may attenuate some of uh, those symptoms. And again, cannabis is a biphasic and dose dependent effect on anxiety and mood, such that low doses tend to be anxiolytic and high doses tend to be anxiogenic. So um, there are some studies on cognition. Um, there is a pretty clear evidence that um, with acute THC use, you see def deficits in short-term memory, attention, concentration, and executive function. Um, sometimes that will attenuate with uh, the use of CBD alongside the THC. Um, if we limit our attention only to medical cannabis products. Uh, most of these are oral or sublingual. Uh, six of 23 studies uh, in a review by Veganhorst uh, noted any statistically significant short-term impairment, and even those that they found were below clinical thresholds at low to moderate doses. So it really does seem to be the dose that determines the level of impairment. Um, and then there is very scant evidence for persistence of these cognitive effects beyond eight hours. Um, if we contrast that, however, to heavy chronic use, um, we do see that to be associated with some structural changes in the gray and white matter in the brain, as well as uh, varying degrees of cognitive impairment that do have the potential to be long lasting uh, with more mixed and at times contradictory evidence for uh, uh, similar changes among people who use more moderately. Um, hey Ben. Yes. Uh, one question in the chat, and I know that uh, Dr. Szymanski has his hand raised. Just give oh, yes. the chat first. Um, is it fair to say 
uh, cannabis withdrawal symptoms are about equivalent to ca caffeine withdrawal symptoms? You know, I can't say that I've ever seen a study that compared them head to head. Um, I think that with caffeine withdrawal, um, that syndrome is over a lot more quickly than the cannabis withdrawal. Um, caffeine, of course, is a, is a hydrophilic substance and uh, passes from the body relatively quickly, whereas uh, 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 cannabinoids are often lipophilic and deposit themselves in the body's fat stores and then uh, sort of evaporate up off of them at a slower rate. Uh, Dr. Szymanski. Which is why taking blood levels to assess driver impairment is a really bad idea. Um, Precisely. But uh, my question is, I noticed the symptoms from withdrawal did not include craving. Is there, is there craving? So, yes, yes. Um, I, I wrote that slide before I, I started developing a clinical protocol for the evaluation of, of cannabis withdrawal. And, and indeed, you will see craving, though that can be confounded by the presence or absence of cannabis use disorder itself. And, and you know, this sort of gets at the core of what we talk about when we think about the difference between um, dependence and a use disorder. Or de dependence and uh, true addiction. Precisely, yes. Um, so uh, another quick note, pulmonary implications. Well, while cannabis is an acute bronchodilator dilator and was used in the 1800s for asthma, um, chronic smoking will produce inflammatory changes in the large airway mucosa that can cause wheezing, coughing, and increased sputum production. Um, there isn't strong evidence for distal or alveolar injury. Uh, and after adjusting for cigarette smoking in longitudinal studies, there's little evidence for an association between cannabis and COPD or lung cancer. Um, I will note, however, that there were early concerns about vape-associated lung injury that were thought to be related to chemical adulterants in the illicitly sourced cartridges that were uh, uh, under investigation. Um, this underscores the uncertainty and potential danger of vaporizing unregulated cannabis products. Those that are sold in, in Pennsylvania uh, dispensaries, however, uh, again, have a, a considerably more uh, a rigorous and regulated uh, manufacturing process. Um, driving under the influence, uh, of course, any kind of substance that's going to impair your executive function is going to impair your ability to operate heavy machinery. Um, Systematic reviews and meta-analyses suggest a low to moderate association between cannabis use and motor vehicle crashes. Um, however, um, on population level studies, they have not found a clear association between uh, a state legalizing recreational medical cannabis and uh, worsening statistics of road safety. Uh, finally, there's uh, cannabis hyperemesis. Uh, which is a form of cyclic vomiting that's thought to be associated with chronic regular cannabis use. Uh, patients will present with belly pain and vomiting, uh, and they'll oftentimes, and this is sort of the pathognomonic feature of the history, they'll often report that their symptoms resolve with hot showers. Um, treatment, of course, is discontinuation of cannabis, uh, and improvement may take weeks. So it's, it's often a tough go of counseling these patients that they need to stop this thing that they oftentimes think is treating the nausea that it causes. Uh, uh, I see another hand up. Uh, uh, Kina Sears. Hi, uh, doctor. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. Um, just more of a comment and, and maybe some clarity. Um, as a patient, I, you know, I definitely experienced firsthand just, you know, you mentioned no retaliation by healthcare practitioners, but having some spine challenges. I visited an orthopedic surgeon who, when I went into the room, the first sign that I said, if you are a medicinal marijuana patient, please disclose this because you will not be provided like any other drugs or anything else. Like it was very, the tone of the note seemed very um, punitive in terms of, you know, if I had asked for other, you know, drugs to help with the, the spine pain. So I was just wondering, it's more of a common, and I'm glad that this information is getting out there because I think I need to choose orthopedic, you know, providers maybe that are part of the MM, you know, network. Yeah, indeed. I think that there's still, and, and owing in large part to the complicity between the medical profession and uh, the, the 
folks who perpetrate the war on drugs, there, there's uh, oftentimes a lot of stigma that comes with drug use. My, my hope is that uh, legalization of medical cannabis and more research will help us fight against that kind of stigma and will um, you know, allow us to form networks of, of more forward thinking uh, providers uh, and and you know and, and indeed try to try to fight against this sort of discrimination that that often cuts not just through uh, patterns of substances but also through patterns of, of race, gender, and, and socioeconomic status. Great. Uh, and and then just a quick um, question: you had mentioned about you know not really strong correlations between um, marijuana use and pulmonary diseases or you know smoking um, increase in smoking. Does that depend on the the method, the way that you inhale or use marijuana? For example, in a hollowed out cigar, would that increase the probability of smoking related um, diseases? I, I counsel my patients that anytime they burn plant material and put it into their lungs, they're they're causing a whole bunch of inflammation. The the lungs have to work really hard to clear soot. And uh, while they have not done head-to-head -head studies comparing the safety of vaporization compared to smoking, um, the preliminary literature that we see from the tobacco literature suggests that you might see up to like a 95% decrease in uh, the accumulation of toxic compounds in the lungs with vaporization compared to smoking. Again, this is trying to extrapolate from uh, evidence on tobacco uh, uh, smoking versus vaporization. The, those studies are, are likely going to be forthcoming in the cannabis literature. Um, pediatric exposures, I see we're, we're getting towards the end of our time. Um, just they're really important. A lot of times these cannabis products look like candy from the outside. Uh, it's important that kids know that they're not candy. Uh, really bad things can happen if kids get into cannabis and, and you know take massive doses. Um, there's even been one death reported in the literature in the last month. And uh, um, I think that um, one important aspect of the cannabis law has to do with uh, uh, packaging and labeling uh, restrictions. So finally, uh, my hope is that, you know, we were able to establish an understanding here of the role of cannabis in modern medical practice. Um, for some indications, the evidence is strong. For many others, it's less consistent. And as physicians were taught and most comfortable working within this paradigm of evidence-based medicine. However, once you get to the bottom of that algorithm where the patient has either tried all of the standard therapies or doesn't have access to them, even those indications with mixed evidence for efficacy may make sense as options in the specific and individualized risk-benefit discussion that we have with our patients. Um, again, it comes down to what are we trying to do with the cannabis? Sometimes the indications are clear cut as above, but there might be additional reasons for certification. For instance, there may be a compelling harm reduction rationale for certifying patients for cannabis who may otherwise be obtaining cannabis of unknown provenance, which according to numerous case reports has the potential for adulteration. Um, still other patients may be choosing to use synthetic cannabinoids in order to avoid trouble with employers uh, or with uh, the state carceral system. I will sometimes certify these patients from a harm reduction perspective to uh, help them avoid using K2. Finally, in a country that continues to incarcerate and punish people of color for cannabis possession at rates far exceeding those of white folks, it might be worthwhile to ask ourselves as clinicians about our duties and interactions with the state as they relate to our duties and interactions with our patients. All of this, however, must be subsumed underneath our highest duty, to do no harm. So when I talk to patients about cannabis, I always situate it in the terms of risk, benefit, balance, and informed consent. Again, what are we trying to do with the cannabis and is it working? Um, I had to read a bunch of papers to put this talk together. Um, and uh, this is my contact information if uh, anybody wants to uh, get at me. Um, I, I can certainly stick around for, for another 15 or so minutes if we have additional questions. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Cochiaro. Definitely wanted to follow up with a little few more questions here on my end, but certainly understand if anyone has to, to jump off. We are still recording this and we'll have it posted to our website, um, hopefully in the coming days. 
Um, but definitely kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, certainly a lot in there about the patient physician relationship and kind of understanding it from a patient perspective um, or from the, the clinician perspective certainly can help the patient um, to better um, understand that thought process. Are there any recommendations that you have um, oh, for a patient in terms of talking to a, a clinician, talking to your provider, um, in terms of being able to better help them understand medical cannabis or kind of dealing with kind of those more stigmatizing situations that uh, Kino was talking about? I think it's tough. Um, you know, I, I, other than word of mouth networks of, of you know, providers who, who we know to be safe, um, it's, it's hard to know how much to trust your doctor. And I would say that when I counsel patients, I say, trust them as much as they've earned it. Um, I think there's, um, you know, a, a problem with the way that we have our, our certification machine in place in Pennsylvania. The law was written such that they wanted primary care doctors to be certifying their own patients. But the law was also written with these additional requirements that doctors have to go through an eight hour video course and then they have to pay a $250 certification fee. And that makes it really difficult for, uh, for patients to, um, to get certified by their primary care doctors. Oftentimes they go to these sort of, you know, either fly by night or hole in the wall uh, um, places that, that don't have great continuity. So um, yeah, I think this is a challenge and something that I hope that, that we address in the law uh, with further revisions to it. Great. And I know that we talked a little bit about... Uh, I'm sorry, I see a, a hand up with Dr. Smansky. Yeah, I wanted to follow on your comment because, um, and Jim's comment, um, because what you laid out is how you personally approach the screening and assessment. Um, to me, first of all, I think it's outstanding, but to me, it points out the difference between how someone who is um, uh, trained in and, and sensitive to the behavioral component of this whole profile and how to, um, uh, you know, how to certify someone and make recommendations as compared to someone who has their patient's best interest at heart, perhaps I'm getting, staying away from the fly-by-night stuff because we know that's a problem. Um, uh, you know, primary care physicians write by far the preponderance of scripts for psychoactive agents for patients, um, not psychiatrists. And, you know, you've pointed out how important a full holistic approach to the patient is in this, if you're going to be serious about it. So that does leave me some pause about, as you just said, how strict we are about who gets to certify patients. Yeah, indeed. I think that, um, you know, one thing that I, I would love to do with this research center at some point, if we're to develop more curricular activities, is to um, create a more open source form of the state approved education that would, uh, you know, maybe eliminate that that uh, $250 barrier uh, that seems to be preventing folks from certifying patients. However, that isn't the only thing that uh, prevents patients from being certified. Um, uh, I work at an FQHC 20 hours a week down at uh, Southeast Health Center, and um, I've worked at several other FQHCs, all of which, on the advice of their lawyers, have forbidden their providers from doing certifications at all, because uh, these FQHCs uh, receive federal money, and the, the lawyers believe, though it's never been uh, demonstrated in either case law or police actions, that... Um, uh, providers certifying patients at an FQHC would violate the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, I see a hand up from, from Stephen. Hey, Ben. Great, great talk. Uh, really, very, very informative. Just kind of one, one question that sort of has been um, kind of coursing through our research on, on medical um, cannabis use among patients in LA, and I think it's also relevant in pen, the pen research we're doing in Pennsylvania. Is this this idea of um, that almost by definition, a patient is going to be using at higher rates, higher frequency, um, more intensively than someone who might otherwise be using for more sort of, you know, adult use or pleasure kind of purposes. So how do you, how do you kind of um, sort of just ac account for that and sort of 
parse out whether someone who is using for medical purposes and is using at high rates, when they tip towards this sort of disorder kind of box versus being more in the functional kind of realm, but but using at high rates. So do you see that as a tension or is it? Yeah. Sort of yeah. So I, I look at a couple things. I, I think I, I use two heuristics. First heuristic is, is the pattern of use consistent with the recommendations for the condition that the patient's trying to treat? If I have a patient who's got anxiety disorder, again, where low doses of THC are demonstrably more effective than high doses, and that um, products with CBD and THC uh, at at least equal amounts uh, are more effective than high THC products, if the patient's using high THC dabs several times a day, then that indicates to me that, that they might have started developing a problem with the cannabis where it's hurting them more than helping them, but maybe also clouding their, uh, their judgment of that. But that's only one heuristic. And I think that where the rubber really meets the road, it's in this second heuristic of, is this causing problems for you in your life? And, you know, even, even patients who are, are smoking, you know, an eighth of an ounce of cannabis, you know, every five or six hours, who are, are really deep into cannabis use, um, many of them still have that insight. And they, and they often say, well, you know, yeah, I, I noticed that I used to go outside more. Now I don't. And that's oftentimes for me a good time to, to say, well, all right, well, you know, let's, let's talk more about that. What's preventing you from going outside? And then, you know, if, if, if we can create some shared decision making around, well, maybe it is the cannabis that's, that's causing more harm than good, then we get to start talking about, you know, different mindful ways of introducing a tolerance break here or, or um, you know, trying to get to the root of, well, is there something else that you're trying to treat with the cannabis that's not treatable with cannabis? I think that's definitely an interesting point, especially as we kind of look in, at the different rates of cannabis use disorder in terms of how it's measured and certainly understanding that, that distinction that you brought up earlier in your presentation of um, within the DSM criteria that there are those kind of confounding variables for medical patients where pretty much all doctors will tell you start low and slow and increase your dose. And then if you do have a chronic condition where, that you deal with every single day, you are using it every day. So technically all of those people qualify for the cannabis use disorder. And you can see studies occasionally say that um, cannabis use disorders in 30% of the population or in, within their, their study population. Um, but the studies that you had cited really kind of fluctuated between six and 9%. Um, and I think that's a very good description specifically for patients to really understand kind of those differences in terms of when does your use become actually problematic? Is it preventing you from doing things that you did before? And I think there's an interesting um, perspective, specifically when I've talked to um, a lot of patients, um, whether it be when we're at the PA Cannabis Festival or just um, talking to friends and family who have used both medically and recreationally, how do we understand cannabis use as I know a lot of people say for creativity or even enlightenment when they read and, and to try to help them become deeper, more intellectual people and having these kind of conversations that go along with it. Um, and some people will say to me that, you know, cannabis really helped me to understand that my time is valuable. My, my peace of mind is, is valuable. So even if it's something like where you're not going outside all the time, or you're not hanging out with a certain group of friends anymore, Say someone, someone substituted um, their alcohol use, which they were drinking seven days a week with an occasional, their ca occasional cannabis use. They stopped hanging out with their friends that, that had these kind of trouble patterns of alcohol use or other substance use. Um, and it's very important to kind of parse that out and, and also have um, uh, medical guidance to go along with it that's supportive um, to kind of help people to determine that. But then also parsing out, are you, is that cannabis use? Are you only staying home and doing that? Is it the only thing that you do? Is it preventing you from going out and seeing friends that you didn't have unhealthy patterns with? Um, so kind of having those conversations is something that um, I hope that, that patients are starting to catch on to and certainly understanding that kind of 
drug sentence setting um, type of conversation and kind of facilitating that within public out outreach and conversations is something that will be necessary moving forward to um, as, as we talk certainly with you having an MPH of rather than being that kind of the MD perspective of no, it's individual behavior that we should stop doing this. Um, more the MPH mindset of we should be looking more towards how do we cut down on, on the, the risks, the side effects, how do we influence behavior um, and create that awareness to help people. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts kind of more on that in terms of that dichotomy of individual behavior versus kind of population health um, with cannabis. and. Uh -huh. It's like that, that John Adams quote, you know, I, I study economics so that my children can study art and literature. I, I, I study medicine so that my patients can, can reach a functional level where they can focus on their creativity and, and flourishing. And, you know, I think that, um, again, like the big question is, what are you trying to do with the cannabis? And then the second question after that is, is it working? And you know, my hope through my work with the research center here is to try to help answer those questions for the, the medical domain. I, I don't know if we'll ever have clear scientific answers to the questions of whether or not or the extent to which cannabis facilitates creativity. Um, certainly, they've tried writing papers on it, but I think that, you know, oftentimes creativity is something that, that um, defies our, our scientific categorization thereof. Great. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to give another five seconds here if anyone wants to raise their hand or just jump in. All right. But if not, thanks very much, Ben. Um, it was great having you. Uh, thank you to everyone who asked questions. It's been a great conversation around this. Um, be hopefully posting this on our website coming forward. Um, and stay tuned to our website coming up um, over the, later in the summer. We should have our, our September, October, November speakers set pretty soon. Um, so stay tuned to our website or look out for our emails about a upcoming speaker series. Um, thanks again, Ben. Thank you to everyone else. Have a great rest of your, rest of your week. All right. Thank you all. Thanks again, Ben.